Hi everybody, Will Alexander from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips, brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV. This week on the interview chair we have my very dear friend, Mr. Doug Belter. So sit back and enjoy an hour with Doug. Hi everybody, today's special guest on the interview chair is my very good friend and arch nemesis, <laughs> Doug Belter. Hey Doug, how are you? Hey, Will, how you doing? Like I said, we've been frenemies for like, I don't know how long since <laughs> that I, the first Irish setter you had. Yeah, that no, was the middle of mid-80s, yeah. Yep. yep. <laughs> I remember that meeting well. <laughs> <laughs> so things are well out there? Yes. Out here in the wilds of Michigan, yes. Out of Michigan, you're probably just as cold as we are, if not colder. Yeah, it was, uh, it's actually been warming up. It's starting to yeah. thaw, so we're real happy about that. Oh, good. How's Kay? Kay's doing well. She's uh, she's at the hospital right now working, so it's been, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting year. That sure has. Well, let's get right into it, brother. Okay. How old, how old were you, <laughs> and how did you get started in the sport of dogs? Well, as like most things in my life, it's been affected by girls. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was when I was like thirteen or fourteen, I was I was a terrible athlete. I tried out for football and things like that. I was awful. I mean, really awful. Do you remember when we played, played football the the blue water dogs? Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> All those Sorry. Kids, all those it hurt the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the um, I tried out for the football team. That didn't work out so good. So uh, I was in the band, of all things. And this very nice young lady behind me with a clarinet, which made screeched all the time. She said, why don't you come to the dog show this weekend? So I went down to the Edmonton Kennel Club dog show. That was back in 1972. Wow. I, was I walked never- around... Pardon me? I was seven. You know, I really hate you right now, but that's all right. Uh, the It was, uh, yeah, I went to that show and, and was just, like, enthralled with all the dogs. Because I never came from, my family kind of skipped a generation with my dad and my mom from dogs. My, my grandparents were both, um, both sides were from, one set was from England and one set was from Germany, and their parents and their kids, they were all involved with dogs, but it was the working side. My grandfather uh, from England had rat terriers, or fox terriers that he used for ratting. And my grandmother on my dad's side was from Germany, and her father was a gamekeeper, so they used dachshunds on boar and stuff like that. So it was, it was actually a skipping a generation and then coming back into dogs so it worked out well and i ran into a very nice lady by the name of joan vance who had lightened english setters and i in february of the next year the puppy was born i picked the puppy up in april raised it up september in 1973 was my first dog show where i actually got to compete and uh went to that show and Ellsworth Gamble gave my six to nine puppy dog winner, best of winners for three points. I, I can still remember it. He well, kept on yelling at me, your puppy's pacing. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he was very blunt old man, but he explained things very well. He was a good dog man. And uh, then I ran into uh, some people by the name of Doug and Shirley Smith with English cock, uh, with American cockers and boxers. And they kind of took me under their wing, and they, they ran the Edmonton Junior Kennel Club, which was, uh, they taught junior handling, and they taught you how to use poop scoops, because you were, back then, they didn't have professional cleanup crews or anything else like that. It was, the kids in the kennel club went around and did all the poop scooping and things like that at the shows. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, do that now. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. We had our little yellow jackets with, you know, Edmonton Junior Kennel Club on the back and Afghans went in and we took an entire garbage can and set it right there just so we would be ready. <laughs> so you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> so and then after that, uh, I showed, yeah, I showed that dog and he was uh, 75. He was number one English setter and number 10 sporting dog. Jeez, that's good. And so, it, and then it just kind of progressed from there. I, I showed a few dogs for some other people. Um, the problem with being out in the West was we didn't have as many professional handlers as there were back East. We had like maybe three and two of those were on the West coast. So they weren't on the prairies uh, on the prairies. Basically we had a lot of really good breeders, Sue Corpin with McCam and Irish setters, uh, Mark Wilmot with the new fees. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had really, really good breeders out there, but they were kind of breed specific. And I think that's what made them so successful is they were that breed specific, but to find that someone that you could work for. So I wound up working a couple summers for Jimmy Campbell. That's an old name. And he, uh, yeah. I learned a lot. From, I learned things from Jimmy. Uh, the funniest thing I learned was how to load a van in 15 minutes when you lost everything. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him! Leave <laughs> the Bouvier's crate open. <laughs> yeah. When Jimmy was loading and he had to have a good day, he stayed the heck out of the way because it was not good. <laughs> but uh, from there, I went to uh, work for Dennis Springer. Now, what year was this? How old were you? Oh, I would have been twenty, maybe twenty-one. Oh, so you were that old when you went to Dennis's, okay? I didn't realize. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I had worked. I had gone through showing dogs, and then I, I actually quit showing dogs for two years uh, when I was eighteen to nine to twenty because I just had enough, and I wanted to try some other things. Uh, my dad was encouraging me. My parents, because I got into the dogs, um, he finally found a dog food company that he could get a franchise for. And we sold dog food out of the back of our garage for six months. And then he said, enough's enough. And he proceeded to open it between he and my mother. They opened 17 pet supply stores in Alberta. Wow. <laughs> and that was before like PetSmart and some other ones. And when PetSmart and the, you know, the big box ones came in, he, he just said, I, I, we don't need to do this. And they just shut it down. So they kept uh, the lab diets and stuff like that, which my brother runs now for, uh, you know, exotic foods and, and the uh, universities for their studies and whatnot. He still runs that. Oh, good. But so I took a little bit of time off there, went to technical school and got my veterinary technology certificate. And then I went to work for Dennis and he taught me a lot. He taught me that I don't ever want to be broke because no matter what Dennis did, he struggled. He always struggled. And I just said, no, I don't want to be late. I don't want to be broke. So I'm going to have to do something different in this game than what Dennis is doing. But he taught me how to trim terriers and make, make them really make them look for that, for that time period. That was the early eighties. That was, uh, that was before, everybody discovered that we had to blow dry everything. So a lot of it was just, you had short legs on your terriers because you didn't have all the big thick furnishings that you could blow out. I mean, you go back and you look at some of those pictures of George's wires and, and some of the other ones, and they were very small, tight legs that they had on them back then. And then I went to work for Paul, Paul Boer, who was, the people that remember Paul remember him well. <laughs> he was a big old tough ex-Marine. He played football for the Green Bay Packers. I didn't know that. When he came out of the Marine Corps. And so that kind of gave you an idea of how big he actually was. He was a very large man. He's what, he was one of the instrumental people in bringing giant schnauzers into America. He brought a, a dog in from Germany called Quaydam in the 50s that was owned by the Butels. And they were some of the first giant schnauzers that really did any winning. 
but very German type, a lot of hard hair and not much furnishings. And Paul taught me how to keep dogs healthy on the road, which uh, I think is one of the things we're lacking in a lot of the young people that we've got coming up now. Well, there's no question. I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. Animal but he, uh, he was great. He taught you how to watch dogs. He taught you how to, I mean, you pick, you pick dogs up and you walk them out to the runs or you walk them on a rope every morning and you were watching. And I mean, it was, it was fun because first week I was there, it was like I had to march into his office and give a total report of every dog. And we had like 27 dogs there. And I had to know exactly what each one's poop looked like, whether they had an accident in the crate, were they limping, what did their weight feel like when you carried them, uh, was there anything else that he needed to know about. So he really taught you how to, how to evaluate your animals and make sure that they were healthy. He said, you can have the prettiest dog in the world. If it ain't healthy, it ain't showing. Oh, exactly. So. I got, I mean, I've, I've, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from you on that aspect too, because we spent a lot of time together traveling to some shows. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I did. I picked up a lot. Like I remember talking about, I hate to say it, about poop. You know, <laughs> how did that poop look? You know, was it Dairy Queen? Was it you know? <laughs> Just certain things. And uh, those are things that you you. It becomes second nature to you. You know your own dogs, right? You know your own dogs, and there's something right. that changes, you know, right away. So, yeah, then, I mean, I mean, you used all your senses. You used your eyes. You used your ears to see if they were, you know, there's any strange noises coming out of the truck. And I mean, you used your nose. Did that right. was was that a foul poop or was that just a poop that it it you know you you didn't do something right and you didn't exercise it enough and you just had to go. Yeah. But I mean, so yeah, he, he was, he was great that way. Um, probably taught me that I don't want to mess around with some people. Uh, he just, he just, I learned from him to just walk away from things because he was, he was kind of an aggressive gentleman when it came to showing. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to be like that. And I tried it didn't quite work when I came back to Canada, <laughs> um, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I thought some. <laughs> Gertie, I thought you may want to edit this. Good good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I know. I so I came back. I came back and started showing dogs, and I was like, I was going to be the king of the world in two days. I mean, like when I ran into you, and what was that, eighty-six or something, when you had that Irish setter. First question out of my mouth was, "Who's a hot shot with the red dog?" <laughs> 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 so we had uh yeah so then i we just started showing i mean we ran into each other there and then you came out to calgary a couple times and we had some entertaining times out there we sure did and then we uh then we actually nothing really happened until we started competing head-on with some of the other breeds like beagles and you had the irish setter i had the english setter Things like that. Yeah, it was it was good competition. I think we made made each other stronger, better at what we were trying. We to certainly do. made each other better handlers because I mean, we were both at our at a, probably at the tops of our games in our areas. But you know, when you swagger into somebody else's territory, sometimes it's not so <laughs> not so easy when you do that. <laughs> Okay, enough of that. What happened, <laughs> what happened after you left Falls? Well, <laughs> well, I went back home, yeah. and I started showing dogs, and I started working for my dad at his dog food company, and that lasted all of two years. And then I opened up a boarding kennel, and trying to do shows and board at the same time. And, of course, since I was such a control freak, because Paul taught me that I had to be in charge of everything. I, I basically was running myself ragged, and I finally it was just like, no, I just I'm going to show dogs for a while, and then I moved well, to Calgary. You know, I, I stayed there a couple of times with you. Yeah, you know, yeah, a big operation. Yeah, I remember you sitting there watching me load the truck. And, yeah, yeah, can I help you with anything? <laughs> you would never let me. So I was like, oh, I don't know. no, but it was uh, it was like but, all indoors. It was it was. Un, uh, it was the first of its kind in that area, anyway. And uh, yeah, 
it yeah, was, it was pretty impressive. You know? It was one of the first indoor challenges that we, in Western Canada where we had everything climate controlled because of the weather was so bad in the winter time. Right. We just we just had to, and it was by the airport, so we were able to do the quarantining for the airport and, and things like that, which was that was a whole different deal when you we got a bunch of dogs in from. Puerto Rico or Costa Rica, I can't remember which, one of the two places, whole bunch of golden retrievers, put them in the quarantine area, and it, it had warmed up, like it was really, really cold out, and it had warmed up. There were ticks, like stink bugs, climbing up the walls. Oh. It was insane. I just freaked right out. We had to go through and I'm sure you did. <laughs> oh, it was just no. You can't do this in my kennels. So yeah, it was it was very interesting. But um, yeah, it was it was it was fun. We had uh, had a lot of a lot of good times. Yeah, I remember when you came out a couple times and you just you were staying there, and then we'd drive down and we'd be driving along, and you'd, I'd be looking out the window, and you'd say, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm looking out at the moon." He said, "What do you mean?" Said it's full moon. It's gonna be an interesting show. <laughs> <laughs> How come we didn't have assistance? Where were our assistants? <laughs> we didn't have assistance back then. That was that was you came out with the Irish Center, went to Lethbridge. Yeah, yeah. Remember? You remember? Yeah. And we were we went to Lethbridge Dog Show, and you were there, and you were so excited because Mrs. Clark was doing best in show, oh. the group and best in show that night. <laughs> <laughs> and you were all excited. It's just like, yes, William's going to be smiling tonight, and he's going to have the big ribbon for Mrs. Clark. And there was a judge change for just Irish great. setters only, <laughs> just Irish setters, <laughs> just Irish setters. And I I looked at it and I went, uh oh. <laughs> this is not going to be good. No. And it wasn't. No, it wasn't good. No. <laughs> I'm glad you were there to keep control of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had we had the crates along one side, and then it was in, it was in a cattle bar. So the crates were along one side, and the fence for the keeping that you tied the cattle to were on the other side. And Will walked all the way down to the end, put his dog away, turned around, and I could tell just the way he threw his lead on the on the ground. That yeah, he wasn't going back out there because he was going to get benched, and it was October, and he needed to. So I stood there with my arms across between a crate and the fence, and he said, "Get out of my way!" I said, "No way, you're not going out there. <laughs> not till you calm down." <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, forgot about that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so uh, all right. What about, some, what about some, who would you consider your mentors, Doug? Like, you talked about Dennis, and you talked about um, Paul, obviously. But you've yeah. had more, because you've, you've, uh, like, you've been in this well, for so long. So. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of people that, if you care to listen to a lot of these, a lot of people that are at the shows, you can learn a lot from just about everybody. Uh, I mean, I learned a lot from, um, I learned from you. Uh, I learned from, you know, I mean, I'd come over to you and say, I, I got to fix this dog's neck. What do I do with it? And you'd say, well, stop chewing on it and just use your thinning shears and you'd be fine. And, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of conversations that we'd have. But, uh, I mean, I got to move down here and meet George Ward. Yeah. And he was great. He, he, he. I only got to meet him for about a year and a half, and then he passed away. Uh, Rick Shashudian was another one. Uh, Wood Warnell, who's a good friend, he he teaches me. We talk. He teaches me, tells me things. Uh, I, I think you can learn a lot from just about everybody. There was a little judge in that came from Holland, and I can't remember what her name was. And she... She, she made me sit down and have a conversation about breeding with her, about breeding dogs with her that lasted, I'd say, two hours at the Ottawa Dog Show at the show of shows. She just, she loved my wire fox terrier. She gave it high marks. She went, uh, she, that was the one before Bentley. Oh, Dylan. Back in, Dylan, yes. Uh, Brookhaven Star, Stargazer or Starblazer or something like that. 
and he uh, he she talked about how the English breed and how she feels that the, how they get their how they get such quality dogs. And that was back when England was quarantining, so it was like a smaller gene pool. And so she would she would tell us how she felt that it was about you take if you want good dogs, you take your very best tightly bred line bred dog and you breed it to just a bitch. Not not an ugly bitch, but a sound bitch, but without a tight pedigree. And that way you get your tight dogs in the reverse with bitches. So she was interesting. Hans Leitman, I was proud to call a friend. And he was one of the he was one of the best teachers. I'd go over to Europe and he'd be standing at ringside and he'd make me judge Sharpays from ringside. I don't know anything about Sharpays, but he would tell me, he would, he would say, pick out which ones and tell me why. And it was, those were the guys that we need back in the sport. That if you're watching at ringside, they'll walk up and ask questions. Why, why do you think that one's a good one? Why don't you think that one's a good one? Which one would you put up and why? Not just oh, because it's the prettiest groomed one. No, that's that's not what they would they would think about. So I think I think that's some of the people that I I hung around with. One of the best people I I still remember was Susan Hillman. You remember Susan? Oh God, yeah. She was she was unbelievable. She was great, and she was she could she could drink <laughs> and she could groom. I remember. I remember flying in and smoking a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, trimming on a poodle cigarette hanging out of her mouth and a glass of vodka and gin and uh, gin and tonic gin over tonic. on the corner yeah. table. Gin and tonic. She was uh, she was she was awesome and one of the best hosts that you ever had. She she'd come and she'd drop everything and come to the airport and pick you up if you're flying in and and look after you totally during that that whole time and. Uh, she would. She was great. Yeah, she was a lady of our she, and, shows, you know. Oh yeah, and she would. She would. I I remember flying in. It was at. I think it was the Beagle National. You won down in Phoenix or something like that, or down in uh, Scottsdale. Okay. Yeah. And I was there. I I showed a young dog there, and I flew out with him. And she met me at the airport. It was eleven o'clock at night when I flew into Vancouver because I was there for the uh, Lower Mainland shows. Oh yeah. Remember, and I was that was that was ninety one because I was showing Fanny, and uh, I flew in there. Uh, the girls had brought my truck and the dogs out, and so I flew into Vancouver. She picked me up. We never went to bed that night because I sat up talking dogs with her while she trimmed dogs all night uh, because she'd come to the airport to pick me up. Yeah, and that was I still remember those days, but we don't have that anymore. We don't have we don't have people of the younger generation that are, that I don't know if they don't want to learn or they don't, uh, or they don't have the opportunity to learn from people like that. No, I, I think I, I, I do have a theory on, I think our, I think our sport has become, um, it was more camaraderie back there than we hung out a lot more, I think. And we chatted more. And, and not that they don't have the camaraderie anymore, but I think it's become real business-like to them. And they work all day, and they are tired. So they don't tend to yeah. sit around and talk to the old-timers. and the, Like, <laughs> well, I'm in bed by nine. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but back then, we didn't have, I mean, let's face it, we didn't have cell phones. Oh, exactly. We were not continually talking to someone at all the time about whatever who wore and whatever somebody said. I mean, we had to actually have conversations where we went and discussed things. Oh, for sure. And and that I think that made a that made a big difference. That that right now we're not getting a lot of younger people in, into some of the breeds because why should they go and work for six weeks to get a dog in shape for that two minutes in the ring? Yeah. They don't. They don't. They don't, I mean, you're going to work on an English cocker to get it into the national specialty, and you're going to make sure its top coat is perfect. You're going to make the furnishings right. You're going to make sure everything's right. That's time-consuming. 
And that, that's, you have to have that passion. And if you can get your reward by winning 4,000 gold coins on a stupid video game, <laughs> and that gives you satis and that gives you satisfaction, well, you're not going to be spending that six weeks on that code. Well, and, it's, and it's also like, well, if they have, have a question to ask, they don't come and ask me or you, they just Google it now. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Siri, Siri's really smart when it comes to trimming dogs. She's she's real clever. <laughs> I remember, I remember um, when I was showing impresario, Mike Billings was doing the combined, and this was about we all knew probably mid August who was doing the combined specialties, and Garrett was on me, you know, make sure he is perfect for Mike Billings. He like we worked him, we guys, I did everything I could to get that dog in shape. No, we didn't win. But I was really happy with how my dog looked. We won one of the days, I think. But yeah, but uh, he, I was. It was a, it was a lot of work. And it was, it was like that with anybody. Like I, back then, when if, if Janie was showing up or Annie was showing up, it was on your calendar. You made sure that your dog was ready by that date. You know. Yeah. Well, you. I mean, it's it's like now. I somebody asked me what I considered a good panel at a dog show, mm -hmm. and now I consider a a great panel. If there's at least two to three people on that panel that you would ask to come grade your litter, yeah, or buy you a dog. I mean, the same way, yeah. Then, or yeah, or buy you a dog. That I think is a great talent. And unfortunately, I've gone to shows where that hasn't been the case at all. I remember I mean, being at shows up here once, and do you remember Scott McNair? Yes. Well, he was. He was. He never went to judge. He never went to judge, but he was. He always was there stewarding. I was that. Well, if I want to ask something, I'm going to ask Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and 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 then it's like, um, well, I was, I was talking to Mr. Cavanaugh, and I mean, you told me I couldn't wear a cap, and I just I'm showing off some hair that I'm actually getting back because he stopped sneaking up and rubbing my head. So for good luck for you. So I'm doing. <laughs> but I was I was talking to him earlier today, and I, I just was. Like who do we, who do we pick out for judges that we want to go show to? It's not there. I mean, we were better off when we had the old boy system, and I and I and I because we've gone and tried to make the playing field so level for everybody, we've pushed down the people who really have the eye because. A lot of times they're the ones who do not have the finances or the time to be able to take all the little courses that need to be done in order to be judges. I mean, we push down people that should be recognized and elevated quickly. Oh, for sure. And, uh, there's an old story about CQC when Bob Waters first applied to judge the CQC. Now, I don't know how true this is. I just remember hearing it. The first time he applied, he sent his application in, and uh, somebody at the CQC sent it back, and they gave him... Dobermans. That's all they gave him. Bob Waters. Well, he, he was fine. He took it. But then a month later, someone saw that Bob Waters had applied, and it was like all breed the next time. It, or at least a couple group right away. Oh, no, Mr. Waters, you get this. And, and let's face it, he was one of our all-time best judges. There's no question, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, uh, we, had, we had some really good judges. Uh, I mean, Bob Waters. I love Merlin Vandekinder, of course. I mean, some of our older ones we had, uh, but I mean, we've lost so many of them that the ones that are replacing, I don't think they're bad judges, but I don't think the expertise is there either. I mean, I, I remember Sean or Herman Felton. He was, he was amazing. He could, if you want, if you were going to get beat, he was going to show you with his hands why you were getting beat. You wouldn't have to go ask him, Mr. Felton, why did you, not like my dog. No, he showed you that he didn't like the shoulders on your dog or something like that. Just just with a hand, if you were smart enough to watch. To notice it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, certain judges, yeah, I, I believe Mrs. Clark, at her last walk down the lineup and best show, she always went to something she didn't like on the dog. And we all knew, you know. Yeah. We all knew what she was doing. So. No. Mrs. Clark, yeah, you go and you throw me in the ring with that beagle dog of yours that was, that was, you had that airedale bitch that you wanted you had to stay on her and i still remember you came to me and you said can you show my beagle and invest in, in show okay i guess so 
who's judging? Mrs. Clark. Okay, well, there I just had to go to the washroom and get myself emptied out because, I mean, showing to Mrs. Clark was stressful. She was a great lady and she was a great dog person, but she scared the bejesus out of me. So I, I was in the ring and I remember circling around working with that dog and I hear this voice behind me. That's it. Keep practicing. And I turned around and it was her. <laughs> yeah. Look, she had given him the national. So. Yeah. <laughs> she, 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 was, she was watching you, man. <laughs> yeah. And so then I went in the ring and what happens? Your beagle gets in a fight with her. Like she reached out to grab his front leg and he pulled it back. And, and there I am with Mrs. Clark and Will's beagle having a fight on the table <laughs> over whether she can hold, hold his foot or not. <laughs> <laughs> Funny one, so whatever. Yeah, I remember. He yeah. this. <laughs> I remember you tell me he wouldn't let her put his. You remember when you filled you know, that gas like... tank? What's that? What? What well, was that? What did you say? Oh, you, I uh, I don't know what happened to my computer. It just went all goofy here for a second. Oh, okay. Okay, now we're back. You you kind of went into slow motion there. <laughs> it was, it was... <laughs> but. Uh, I still remember when you used my face for filling a gas tank. It was just there. It was a, <laughs> it was a magazine. I didn't have a funnel. <laughs> that was that weekend. That was a very interesting weekend. That was also Lethbridge. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some stories about that, but we won't go into those. <laughs> that was a perfectly innocent I didn't have a phone. It was a magazine. I rolled it up and. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Just run the gas right all over them. There we go. We're good. <laughs> so, do you remember that? Oh, my God. I can't read it. I know what it is, though. <laughs> <laughs> Back when Mr. Alexander and I both had hair. <laughs> and we were both showing against each other. He decided it was in his best interest to come out to the West for what, like three months or something? It was like that? Susan's fault. Susan told me, <laughs> she said, if you want to compete with, with the other dog that you had, we had to go head to head. You couldn't, I couldn't pass you by staying away. So she said, you have to go head to head with him. Okay, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's because she had the Lakeland that was number two, and she wanted you to come out and knock me down. Slow you down. <laughs> <laughs> she had a clever lady she got you to do what she wanted to do for her off I went <laughs> off you came and uh, you, you had you had some good judges there were some you had some you had some good lineups but it just didn't work out quite well for you so there's two young handlers sitting he just wants to bring this up just, <laughs> 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 We're BSing away. <laughs> this is over. <laughs> We're BSing away, and he says, "Yeah, well, that friend of yours beat me in best, beat me in the group. Or I would have gone three best in shows that night." That was oh, that Valley. was the Valley, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and I said, "What friend?" And you gave me a name, and I said, "No, it wasn't." He said, "Well, I bet you a thousand dollars." I said, "Well, neither you or I have got enough money to bet a thousand dollars." He said, well, 250. I said, the judge was George Payton, not who right. you said. Yeah. Well, how do you know? Because that guy spent the night in my room because he was just there watching the show. So William Alexander gets a check out for WA Associates, and he writes it out to Doug Chip Belter <laughs> for 250 blanking dollars. <laughs> And it's on the check, as yeah. it is that way. <laughs> and you still have it. <laughs> I have it from 2001. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was 2001. That was 91. That was 91. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what's next on this list then. <laughs> you know, um, no, you've shown some really exceptional dogs over the years. Um, are there any dogs out there that you have watched that you wished you could have shown or been a part of? None, no dogs that are being shown right now. Right, right. So, 
I absolutely adored Gulf Sewell's excellence. I would have liked to have been around to watch and get my hands on Brayside's Dark Side of the Moon, that black English cocker. That yeah, he was, he, he was a beauty. Yeah. He was a beauty. He looked fabulous. I mean, that was, that was the thing. I would, get, I would get the dog magazines when I was a kid out west, and I'd look at these, and I'd see, I'd see the Sally Lynn Springers and, and the English cockers and stuff out there, and I, would just, I was just enthralled until I could actually get something, you know, until I came down here and now there's so many magazines, it's just, I call it puppy porn, so it's just... Oh, yeah, and it's so Photoshop, now you can't pick out the best dogs anymore. Well, no, but the problem I have with the magazines now is people are Photoshop, like we discussed, people are Photoshopping the dogs so much that when you see them, you're either A, disappointed, or if you're not bright enough to figure out that it's not the same, it's the same dog, you still, these judges still put it up, but they don't look the same in the ring as they do in the magazines. And I get disappointed when I see them. Me too. That's a shame. But um, who else was there? There's Gulso Excellence. There's a brace, the Dark Side of the Moon Dog. Um, I love that little beagle bitch, that Judy bitch that Eddie had. I I, I, I looked at those. I looked at those pictures from from the garden and I was just like, how did he do that? Yeah. How did he teach her to do that? I, I, I want to know how you did that. Um, some of the, some of the other terriers were good. I never, I never got excited too much about herding dogs and, and things like that until I started getting into the boons and things like that. But they showed a lot those of were basically, so. yes, there was, there was Grover. Oh yeah, my God! Yeah. Cronkles, Groves, Grover, of whatever the heck his name was, and he was. That was the year that Jimmy Campbell learned how to. I learned that Jimmy Campbell could load a truck in fifteen minutes, because he had another dog out, and it was it was an interesting year. He wound up. I want. We wound up. It came down to Mrs. Clark at Credit Valley last show of the year. That's how tight those two dogs were running. And by winning the breed and placing in the group twice, uh, Grover was number one Bouvier. Jimmy was number two Bouvier. And that's back when it was still the whole working group was the working and the herding group. So Grover was number 10 working dog. Jimmy's dog was number 11 working dog. Oh, yeah. uh, it, was, it was just that close, but... Yeah, Jimmy. Jimmy could load a truck fast. That's why. That's why. Uh, I remember when we talked about Jimmy loading truck? I said, "Leave the Bouvier crate open." That's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> Here he comes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. If he lost Bouviers that year, that was just that. Load the truck, Kim. We're gone. We're out of here. I mean, I remember. That's when. I mean, in Canada, it's a little different. We go and we show the breeds. Now we should go right into the group. Well, they did the breed order and reverse order, and then they did the group. Well, by the time we got out of the group, I hadn't been back to the setup yet because it was Bouvier's almost right into the group. By the time I got back, there was an empty space where he was. He <laughs> <laughs> just tire marks. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, where'd Jimmy go? I guess he's but, not coming back, huh? <laughs> but he was a colorful guy. My God, I always, oh. I always loved chatting to him. You know, he was, he was. What do you say, Willie? What do you know? What do you say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was a customs officer. Oh, was he? He was a customs officer before he was uh, became became a handler. So he he knew he knew all the little things of getting dogs back and forth across the border. He was a very clever man to to be around and, oh, and question. Sure. He, he was he was a clever man because then he went uh, after he got done handling. He went and he bought that uh, show secretary service from uh, Mike Williams. Yep. And started up with that, and they were very successful. I mean, they basically ran the West. Oh yeah, sure. Every, every show yeah. I was out there, he was the he was running. Yeah. yeah, it was always good. Did, to see him. Pretty well did that. Um, <clears throat> so that. When did you when did you move east? I forget now. When did, you were in you were in Alberta, and then you moved. I was east in Alberta, and I moved east in two thousand and one. Two thousand one was okay. 2001, well, 91, uh, 90, well, maybe it was 2000, because 98 
Bentley was top dog. They had the dinner the next year, and then I ran into that bulldog girl and moved out west, of course. And then um, a year later, a year and a half later, I ran into Kate, my wife. And uh, actually, actually, it's very funny. We were talking about English cockers just a little while ago with the Mason girls, and there was this cute little girl, and she was working this black dog in the ring. And he was just a young dog. And she wasn't watching him, and he ran in front of her, and he almost tripped, tripped her. And I got a big chuckle, and I kind of laughed about that. But that was that was my first meeting with Kay, and then uh, Jody Garcini, Jody Paquette Garcini, introduced us, and it just kind of carried on from there. Yep. And then, well, we've been married seventeen years now. Yeah, so, and I was at your wedding. You were the best man. <laughs> and there weren't much help when that bee came around, I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I almost got kicked off of Gross Point Island because <laughs> Mr. Alexander and Mr. Kavanaugh were drunk playing street hockey at two in the morning. <laughs> 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 well, Jody had had a little bit too much to drink too because it's Gross Point Island is Gross 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 Isle is is an island, and it's not that big. And she couldn't find her way off to go to the dog show the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> she had to phone Kay and ask her for directions. <laughs> I don't know what I did the next morning. I can't remember. <laughs> you weren't up. <laughs> Oh, well. But we had a good time. It was fun. I mean, yes, yes. It was a small <laughs> wedding, but it was it was entertaining. Yeah, it was. So then you've been you've been in the states now. How long have you been married? Now you said seventeen years. Seventeen years. Yeah, so you've been in the state. That's hard to believe that you've been down here down there for seventeen years now. Plus seventeen yeah. plus actually. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I came down in August just before. Well, just just before we were married. Kay and I have been seeing each other for almost a year. Yeah. And we decided we were going to do it, and then we went to the immigration lawyer and got everything in order and got married and got our got our paperwork so everything was legal. And I wasn't allowed to travel back to Canada for like three, four months after we got married until they did the paperwork, and then I got a travel permit. So it worked out that way. You've had some great but, success down here, showing dogs, Yeah, and, uh, which was... Uh, that's always fun yes. to take it from our country into this country, and it's just good. It was yeah. I'm so proud of you. So, I think that I think that Canada back in back when you and I were growing up, we learned Canadian handlers. There's a difference. American handlers are very very talented, but they get into group or breed specific. Yeah. I mean, you watch people like the specialized. Like, you know, like Leonardo and and Tracy and and some of the other ones, and they're all so good at what they do, but they're more breed specific. I, I watch, I watch, uh, I mean, even back in the day when I watched people like uh, Clay Cody try and show a Beesla, I was mortified. Yeah. I mean, it was just, but give him a terrier, and oh my word, the man was magic. But give him something else, and it probably wasn't the best thing in the world to watch. But see, Canadian handlers, we had to learn everything. We had to show. Everyone. We may not have. We may not have been the perfectionists that would be demanded of down here, but we could do everything from a standard poodle to a to a beagle to a cocker to to just about everything. I mean, I'm I remember going through my my old photos and I had pictures of best in show dogs from uh, beagles, English setters, Irish setters, golden retrievers all the way through to standard poodles and miniature poodle. And even I've even got a group picture of a toy poodle. That's how, that's how interesting life is. But I mean, no, we, have, we, we had, had to do it. it. Yeah. We had to, cause we couldn't survive on a group. Right. You couldn't make a I living mean, was, unless you were all breed. So. Yeah. I mean, you, it was, uh, it was impossible to be a terrier handler up here. Oh, for because sure. you could not make one, it. there were, there, there weren't terrier. enough terriers and the way the group systems are set up, you couldn't make you you couldn't make any money off of it, so we learned everything. 
Yeah, we had to we had to show everything. There's no question. Um, so, um, so you, you mentioned you met George when you moved down here, down the state. Yeah. And uh, I remember you guys got quite close there for a while. Yeah, yeah, until he passed, and it was uh, he was he was very entertaining. He was like, I love going down there. When I went down to George's, I had to take a case of Canadian beer and a block of extra sharp craft cra or not craft cracker what barrel cheese oh. every time I went down there. What kind? To get him cracker barrel. Oh, cracker, cracker, cracker barrel. barrel. I think I, I think I used exactly. to pick them up. I used to pick them up Macintosh apples and black diamond cheese. I think it was black diamond cheese. That's what it was. <laughs> and we'd have to go, and you could take that, and you could take down a case of Canadian beer. Yeah, well, that's ice, yeah. black yeah. ice. Yeah. And you'd go down there, but you had to make sure that if you wanted to learn something from him, he did it before you got into the beer, <laughs> because then he'd sit around and he'd just be talking stories. So he'd always he'd always show me and and. I was always amazed that he could do something that would take me hours to do. He could do in a matter of 15 minutes, just, just with his hands. Uh, he was amazing. And I, I, re I remember the one time being in the ring with him and a class, he had a class bitch. She wasn't a great bitch, but she was a class bitch. And my dog had had a, uh, he got a piece of grass up his nose. So they had to put him on Anna and, uh, put him on anesthetic to get this stupid piece of grass out because it was inflaming his and of course the anesthetic the coat went to heck so he comes by and he just look at my dog and shake his head i'm going what do you want me to do about it i can't do anything about it I'm going to ring and then we go in and i'm the only special so i go in and i set my dog up and the judge says take him around and i turn around and say are you ready ma'am because there was a class dog that was supposed to be right behind me george had walked past that lady and got right up behind me so he could push his be his bitch against my dog and it was just like well, what did you just do <laughs> and he was he was amazing that way and he didn't win but he, he made me work hard for it i mean i remember going down on one knee one time and he yelled at me for it's a terrier you stand up when you show it what do you think you're doing and uh he called me another handler's name that he didn't like very much. <laughs> what are you doing rolling around on the ground down there? <laughs> but he was, he was a uh, very clever trimmer, very clever trimmer. Whenever I'd show up in Michigan, he always showed up to see and he would, he'd say, okay, bring your dog out. And I'd show him what dog I was showing. Yeah. My favorite George story though, is you couldn't meet George to the dog show. He was always the first one at the dog show. And we were set up next to him. I think it was in Louisville. And uh, I showed up at like 6.05 or something. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Alexander. I'm like, oh, 6.05, George. <laughs> so, <laughs> next day, I'm even a little bit later, like 6.07 or 6.10. He gets up. He was reading the paper in his lawn chair. He puts the paper down. He walks over to my setup, and he stops me. He goes, do you ever miss a dog show entirely? <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a show in Monroe. It was the Terrier Specialty Weekend, so of course he was there. And we were set up, and 6 o'clock, I'm out there doing that. Well, he got there like at 5.59. And he comes walking over, and I'm putting dogs out and standing there with my coffee cup, and he goes, I hope I didn't wake you up. And I went, okay, mister, it's on. <laughs> so I said, to, I said to Kay, I said, set the alarm for 5.45. And she said, what? What are you doing? I said, just just do it. So the alarm went off at 5.45, and I went out the other door for the motorhome. Didn't turn on any lights or anything, but I saw his van coming down the drive because you could see him all the way down the drive. And I walked over to in front of his setup, and when his lights shone on me, I said, it's all right, Mr. Ward. I'll get your cones for you. <laughs> yeah, I moved you the cones out of the way. So he could drive in. <laughs> well, you were notorious, though, for always getting up early. So I remember one time you stayed with me in my trailer. And you and we were, I think, what show, middle of summer circuit. But it was like 5.30. You were like, you had your coffee ready. Let's go put dogs out. I looked up at you. I said, if we go outside right now, they're going to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that, was the same, that was the same circuit that those kids tried to kill us playing tag football. 
Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> that was the same circuit that your young assistant went and put the sheepdog and the old and the Portuguese water dog together because he really wasn't thinking about anything but his after hours things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a young Adam. <laughs> 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 I remember playing that football game, and it was fun. We had a lot of fun. But the next day, it hurt so bad. I, I spoke to you. I said, how do you feel? He said, I'm really sore. And I, But we wouldn't let the kids know how sore we were. Oh, no. Oh, no. You just suck it up and walk proud past them. But then it was, yeah, it was yeah. like, oh, my God. I'll do it again tonight. Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There was, there was just. But then. You don't have those kind of things anymore. Everybody's oh. I, I, part of it is. I mean, we went. I just come back from Iowa, but it, Best in Show finished at eight fifteen. Yeah, that's crazy. How, how can you? How can you do anything when you've got when you're basically working for sixteen hours? Oh, for sure. You know, you walk in a Best in Show and you you still have all your dogs to do before you even go for dinner. So. Well, you you don't get done till ten or nine thirty, and you're eating, and then then you're in bed, and you do it all again at six in the morning. Exactly. Here's a question I think is good for you. Do you have any superstitions? <laughs> How many do you want to know about? <laughs> uh, we don't have that much time left. <laughs> <laughs> superstitions. Well. Full moons are never good. Full moons are never good. Rainbows are good. Um, what about pennies left in your setup? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that poor woman. That was terrible. I did that to her. There was that. You used to have that penny thing where you, you know, you find a penny on the street, you put it in your shoe for good luck and things like that. I had a handler that I used to compete against. It wasn't me. <laughs> and I, no. And I used to, and, it, and we weren't friends. Let's put it that way. We, we are, we, amazingly, we are now. But back then, it wasn't good. And so I went and I handed her this penny for good luck. Well, after she got beat up on, on that day, she had a bad day at the dog show. I had a friend go over and ask her if Doug had given her a penny. And she said, well, yes, he did. Oh, no, don't do that. That's bad luck. Well, she was more superstitious than I was. So then what I'd do is I'd go, I'd have a pocket full of pennies. And I would, like, go around and I would be dropping them in her setup. And she would actually make the kids tear the crates apart to make sure I hadn't put any pennies in the crates or around the crates yeah, or anything. It went on all year long. I know. It was <laughs> 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 well, then I did it to Mr. Paquette. And he was like, oh, yeah, sure, that's not going to work. So he puts a penny in his shoe. And his coonhound and my, my basset were running like neck and neck. The other way pound that year. Pardon me? You had the coonhound, he had the basset. I had, I had the coonhound, he had the basset. Yeah. So he won the group the first day in Credit Valley. So he goes and gets ready to take a step. He gets up and he takes a step. Well, his loafers, I think he was wearing loafers at that time. And he... There was enough space in his shoe that I guess the penny flipped up on its edge and he put his foot down on it and he fell down because it hurt so bad and turned his dog loose in the ring. Well, he didn't go best in show that night. <laughs> but I did win the group the next day so it was top hound that year because of that. <laughs> no, I, I, I remember all that going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you used to come out from out east and just go, you people are crazy out here. I don't understand this. <laughs> what do you um? What 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 are some favorite wins? Do you have some favorite wins that that, that stick out in your memory? Uh, going group two in Helsinki with my bear dog, that was good. Uh, first Beagle National, winning the national with the PBGV. Um, there, there's been, you know, several. You, you look. I remember my first best in show down here was under Roger Hartinger with uh, a fox terrier dog called uh, Snow Terrier Standing Ovation. 
was lovely dog. That he also won the breed at uh, Montgomery the next year, which wasn't supposed to happen. Which wasn't a very entertaining situation in that one because two handlers got in a fight in the ring could, and, and attempted to. Well, they were getting really angry with each other and started yelling at each other. And as the judge was looking at these two fools yelling at each other, I walked around the outside of the ring and stood in front of them with my dog sparring off their dog. And he looked down, saw my dog, and looked at me and said, you, go to the front of the line. And that's what happened there. But so that the Montgomery win was a fun win, too. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to win the show of shows three times. I think three times one two three yeah three times so that was that was when the show of shows was actually something yeah remember those days oh when we were, i mean we were yeah <laughs> there, there was some quality the, the we have in canada where all the best and show winners are invited to compete and it's, yeah. it was sponsored by ralston perina back then and it was it was a big deal in canada to win the show yeah it was yeah i mean it, it would go on all night. everybody flew like, in yeah. It was yeah. black guy. It was we all got to see it, everybody because it was fun. Everybody flew in just for the show of shows, and there was an all breed show attached to it, so it was made for an yeah. event. So it was good to. Yeah. One was... of my favorites though was uh, your garden breed win with Elliot. <laughs> that came out of the You caught everybody looking that day, remember? <laughs> yeah, Elliot, a big old blue dog, and then English setters. Uh, Elliot, was... Abra's manuscript. That was... That was the year that uh, Silk Teddy was supposed to go best in show. Well, Bruce was having a killer year with her. She was like at least yeah. top sporting dog, and she was one of the yeah. favorites walking into the into New York. And and little old Canadian boy takes. Like, <laughs> but at this face, Ellie was a lovely dog. It was it was a he was a good dog. Yeah, big old old fashioned dog. Yeah, big hard going dog. He, I mean, he had he he'd beaten Silk Teddy before, uh, but. I don't know whether I'm just kind of just live in my own bubble a lot of the times, but I really didn't know anything of this kind of stuff was going on. I was just going to a dog show. It was my first garden. I was like, holy cow, this is, this is amazing. New York is just, just, this is, this is it. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And I wasn't expecting anything. Uh, I had a good judge for him, but I mean, Mike Billings had put my dog over so petty before. But it was Dick Webb that did the breed. Dick Webb did it, but just before that, the, the story on that one is, is I had showed Elliot the year before, mm -hmm. and he was one of Canada's top sporting dogs, and he'd done some best in show winning, and he got leased to a gentleman down in the States, and he had sent him to a handler. Well, the handler and Elliot didn't connect. Uh, they didn't have they didn't have a good working relationship, and and Elliot Elliot was a good dog, but he didn't have the greatest work ethic in the world. So you had to make him have a work ethic. You had to you had to keep him conditioned because if you if you let him get soft, he would he would take advantage of it, and he would just not show. So we kept him hard. So this guy phones me up late December says, this isn't working out. The dog's been beaten in the breed for, you know, the last two weekends. I need you to take the dog. And I said, well, you better fly him. So I got him ready, and we'd gone to Portland for the Rose City Classics just before the garden. And Mike Billings was judging. And I went in, showed my Elliot, and he won. So I thought, oh, well, I guess everything's good. And it was Silk Teddy that was there, too. So then we went to the garden, and it was Dick Webb. And we won that one there. And it was like, before I got back to my setup, I had people congratulating me in the hallways. In that, you remember those tunnels yeah. under the garden? There were people, there was, they knew for already what was going on. I, I was just. That was an I exciting was shock. day. I remember yeah. watching it. It was fun to watch. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was good. I remember, I remember watching. I remember watching you with uh, with some of the English setters that you had that you showed, and that was the garden was a fun place to go to. Oh, there's no. Question. It was a heartbreaker too. It was uh, a heartbreaker too, but it was, it was a good fun place to bring with to. those those dogs and those other handlers, especially when we were younger. It was it was fun to compete. 
at that level because you know we were we were in a different country, so it's always fun to get down there and compete with the or, yeah, consider the best and yeah. But I mean, then we still we run into people like Tommy Glassford when he was a handler. <laughs> and Bobby Fisher, and then those kind of things. That I'm, the people that we saw in the magazines that we never got to, you know, never got to talk to too much. There they were in real life. It was yeah. it was amazing to see our icons being there in the flesh. For sure, no, no, it was it was it, there were some exciting times in New York. From the, there's still still even even now, but yeah, the first couple of times you go as a handler it was very exciting. Yes. <clears throat> All right, Doug. <laughs> Here's a question for you. If you weren't showing dogs, what do you think you'd be doing? A big carpenter. Carpenter? Yeah. I guess. Sorry. That's not supposed to be on. Anyway. Okay. It wasn't Colin, was it? Um, he just called me. Yeah, I'd probably be a carpenter. <laughs> okay. or, you know what? The one thing that I always wanted to do, and I, and I discussed it before with, with Kate. What's that? <laughs> Sorry, you were frozen. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Now, yeah, then you froze. Um, I'd be a history teacher. Yeah, I love history. I think I think history is one of the few things that we miss both in our sport. We don't look at the history of our dogs. We don't respect our history in the dog shows, and we don't respect it in the world. And if we could learn from history, we wouldn't be repeating the same mistakes that we're making now Yeah, in a lot of things. You've always kind of been that way. You've always been somewhat of a history buff, as far as I can remember. Yeah. Um, if you could have dinner with anybody from our dog show past that, that has passed, who, who, would you, who would you like to sit down and have a conversation with again? I would like to sit down with Hans Leitman yeah. from Finland. Just a very brusque old gentleman. Uh, his opinion on dogs, but I mean, he could he could nail things. I mean, he taught me things about PBGVs in five minutes that I didn't know about the breed. I mean, just amazingly. I mean, I, I remember one time I had this dog and I'd done some winning with it. And he's, he's standing, staring at it. And I said, what's wrong? He said, what is it? And I said, it's a PBGV. He said, no, it's not. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, its ears are too long. Its back is too long. Its face is too long. It's not a PBGV. It's a grom that didn't grow. And I was like, and, and bang, the light went on. And I knew exactly what, what he was talking about. Yeah. It, was, it was amazing. He said, it's a grom that didn't grow. He's the kind of guy I, want, I would love to go have dinner with. I'd probably learn more at that dinner than I would in five years talking to other people. One last question, Duke. Okay. If you could talk to the 20-year-old Doug Belter, what advice would you give Dougie now? Go to the States, be nice to a girl named Kay, and marry her right away. <laughs> you suck <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I'm gonna stay here for a long time, man. <laughs> there's that. I, there's a few things that I'd like to tell him. Uh, yeah, don't make the same stupid mistakes again. And I've made quite a few mistakes along the way, but. Sure, we all have. I, I will. A lot of people don't understand what how I believe this, but I believe that we all have a plan. And God says, "You can go there, and I'll eventually get you there." It's just how long it's going to take you to figure out how to do it right. Yeah, and then we'll get there. Right. But, all right, Dougie. Well, it was good to see you, brother. Okay. And Take uh, care, my friend. I'm sure I'll catch up to you somewhere on the road. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll be we'll be crossing paths on the road somewhere now. <laughs> All right, man. Okay, talk to you. I'll talk to you in a little while. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in, and watching us, watching Doug and I. We had a good time visiting. Uh, if you like what you see here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. 
If you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. And if you just want to find out what's happening in my world, go to willalexander.net. Until next week, guys, stay safe.